because I'm down to clown. I bite and I've got everything I need. No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me. And I can drive for any neighborhood I please. At any hour, and the police don't do a thing. So if I see a penny on the ground, I leave it alone and fucking flip it. I'm a straight white male in America. I've got everything I need I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee Just like my straight white male dad did to me So if I see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need I've got a pile of broken mirrors And I'm walking under ladders And I'm spilling tons of salt But to me that doesn't matter Cause my skin and my gender and my orientation Are the best things to have if you live in this nation I recommend it highly a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree We do this show live Every Wednesday, right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. The Intellectual Dollar Tree and all of our stuff, I suppose we would call it, is a listener-supported programming. Uh, You can go to echoplexmedia.com, click the support link, and find the best way to support this program. Or, um, I don't know, if you're watching on Twitch, you you know the deal. You know the deal. You 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 know how to do this. Support by uh, subbing. Throwing bits, gift subs, whatever, whatever. There's a group of people that we've I've talked about and alluded to kind of a lot, like on a lot of the shows, actually. Um, mostly, um, I mean, it's the some, some of the members of the PayPal Mafia. The one I really don't like is David Sachs. They have this podcast called All In, and it's supposed to be like a podcast about tech, but it's just like four venture capitalists telling you lies about uh, technology and business. And since we haven't done it yet on the intellectual dollar tree, I figured I'd do it. A uh, quick programming note, uh, much like Tim pool, uh, HK is uh, not streaming today to spend time with his uh, family. So if you're wondering where HK was, he'll be back next week. He didn't like his family that much without any further ado. This is the all in podcast episode 200. It's a big milestone for them. And it is about dueling presidential interviews, SpaceX's big catch, robo taxis and Uber buying Expedia. And I am deeply sorry. Freeberg's channeling Tim Walls over there. I know. Wow. He's as exciting as Tim Walls. Got your flannel on. Do you know what a venture capitalist is, Freeberg? Oh, he's shilling super gut. None of them are wearing a flannel. Well, as of last week, when J. Cal decided to turn all in into a commercial, I was actually going to do a super gut background. Mm. We're launching super gut nationwide in Target this week. Any Target in the United States, you can go into and pick up super gut. You can buy the GLP one booth. Oh, no. Oh no. Oh no. He's selling shit. fucking that, these. Is that the chocolate? Oh no. Or do you He's selling chocolate? fucking supplements. I mean, I like this one's these dudes are like these dudes are fucking VCs. They have they have like more money than they know what to do with and this motherfucker selling supplements. All right. Let's well, get thanks started. Thanks for the support, Jake. I appreciate it. Of course, it. of course, of course. We're cutting all this out. <laughs> no way. Nice this try. is why I do this. <laughs> Next time plug a company. So they got bands. They got bands. <laughs> <laughs> Let your winners ride. Rain Man, David Sachs. We open source it to the fans, and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West Side Queen of Kinwa. That motherfucker just fucker just have his own fucking picture on a wine bottle. November fifth, you can watch live. Sachs will be hosting. No, we're doing that. 
We're doing it. You're hosting it. Your team said you're doing it. And so <laughs> you'll either get to see. Are you not going sacks. to Mar-a-Lago sex? Well, if things continue to look good for Trump, <laughs> oh, I, I might okay. go to Mar-a-Lago. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so well, you're maybe. You come Let's not remote. commit sex. You're maybe. If you no, go to Mar-a-Lago, you're remote. excused. I nope. could no. live stream from Mar-a-Lago. Oh, oh that would be Mar-a-Lago. amazing. Absolutely. That'd be amazing. I'll go to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yeah. If it looks good, I'll go. So maybe that's um, just go. Jeez. What is with this guy's fucking background on Mars? Is that Mars? Yeah, sure. Wait, this guy's background is like they're like. Check this guy's background out on the bottom left. He's like got a background of Mars, and first I thought it was like an oil, like an oil pump of some sort, because that's really why they'd go to Mars if they found oil there. But I guess it's a spaceship. Like, I'm just go. <laughs> of course, I'm invited. I talked to Jared. I mean, Jared things Kushner. look as good as they do right now. But. Well, I'm told from the chat that that's a video. Game. I think we should all be in Mar-a-Lago. Yeah. It's going to be, be a unique experience. Oh my god! Can you imagine being in Mar-a-Lago and he loses? <laughs> oh my god! Well, that's why I don't that would go be in. dark. Unless this yeah. thing is in the back. <laughs> It's got to exactly. be too big to rig. If it's too big to rig, I'm going to mar lot. Too big to rig. <laughs> do you guys think poly market is like, why do you think it's different from the polls? Are we talking about this today? Poly market's showing like 60, 40 or 65, 35 now, right? Yeah, it, because they're measuring different things. I've explained this before. Poly market is people betting on the outcome. So 58% think Trump's going to win. Whereas the polls in a particular state show the percentage of how each person's going to vote. Hmm. So if for sure you knew the election was 5149, the yeah. betting markets would swing to but, 100. But zero. let me ask you this. So Nate Silver's model, which takes the poll from each state and builds in a, a kind of a, a Monte Super Carlo. God, fucking stop. Stop citing Nate Silver. You know, the reason they're citing Nate, Nate Silver now, though, is a uh, rumor has it that Nate Silver is now funded by Peter Thiel. You know, super poll, like a super model for the whole country why is his estimate 50 50 right now while the poly market is betting at 60 40. it's possible he's well because no no no. if if the election goes damn near 50 50 the odds of the republican winning are 60 40 because of the electoral college the people in the betting market probably understand this in his mm-hmm. estimates got it and the betting markets the betting markets seem to uh go based on momentum so mm-hmm. it like it indicates the no, no, no. Momentum. Nate Silver, uh, Nate Silver's yeah, thing yeah. is just a poll of what they call likely voters. This and it, it doesn't factor in the fucking gerrymander of the electoral college. Gonna, how do you think they're going to change after the interviews the last couple of days? Trump on Bloomberg and Kamala on Fox. Do you think those are going to change anything? I don't think so. I think it's all baked in now. Mm-hmm. Well, Trump over the past few weeks seems to have had a surge, owing to the fact that Kamala's interviews generally don't go well. So I think she started yeah. off a little behind started doing interviews to catch up, and now she's a lot behind. Mm. I don't think the Brett Bear interview is going to help her. Well, let me ask you this. I, so my, my observation as, I don't know, I'm not like a super political person or um, whatever, a party-oriented person. I looked at the, uh, a lot of the media on both sides, and it seems like everyone on the left says Kamala did an amazing job on Fox. She defended herself. She showed her skills and her competency. And then everyone on the right's like, she embarrassed herself, she fell apart. And then the same thing happened with the Trump interview on Bloomberg. People are like, on the left, they say, look at how he couldn't handle the interviewer and he fell apart and all his lies were exposed. And everyone on the right's like, look at him, he got a standing ovation. It's almost like everyone's just kind of like self-asserting their their beliefs that they already hold when they judge these people on these interview shows at this point. Wow, this guy's actually fucking making a little bit of sense. They're going to kick him off. Change their view based on these interviews happening? Well, the question is what appeals to that small sliver of independence? Yeah. The question well, more impo- more that. importantly, no, 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 no. This is all about like turnout in the big cities in a few states, right? This is going to be about turnout in Michigan, uh, particularly Detroit, turnout in <clears throat> Pennsylvania, particularly in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, turnout in Georgia, particularly in Atlanta, turnout in Arizona, particularly Maricopa County. You is if... The Brett Bear interview was going so well for Kamala. Why was her staff on the sidelines waving to try and end the interview? That apparently they had like four people, you yeah, know, waving that? and trying to cut that? the who interview said, off. Who said, who said that Bear was the case? It. He did. Brett, Brett Bear said, said it. it. So yeah. But, but what if what if that was what if the time was up? What if they were like, we have thirty, we have a thirty minute slot for you here to here, and it was thirty five minutes, and people were like, hey, time's up. What if the time was up? Like in Rocky Four. What the fuck? And Apollo Creed's corner is like yelling, <laughs> throw in the damn throw in towel, the towel, throw in the damn throw in the towel. towel. They couldn't wait to get off the stage after right. 26 minutes. I just think that if it was going that allegedly, great. Allegedly. Yeah. 
I don't think Brett Barrett's going to lie about that. I don't I think, know why he would lie about that. Why, that makes why, sense. Would, yeah. why would they get off the stage after 26 minutes if it was going so great? I'm not saying it went as horrible as some of the partisans on the other side are, are saying, but I don't think it went that great. Do you Trump, give her any credit Trump for going into the lion's den like she did? Well, I, I think that she went, she did the interview precisely to get the talking point that she does adversarial interviews because that talking point was earning them. And so you saw like all of her fans in the media were saying, well, see, she can walk into the lion's den. But again, she did the shortest interview possible. I don't think she answered the questions directly. I think she filibustered a lot. She deflected a lot. That's what uh, you do during an interview. Persuasive. I don't think she convinced anybody. So I think that what you saw there was somebody who just wanted to get it over with as quickly as possible to check well, the Brett, To be fair, Brett Baer is pretty boring. Okay. Does adversarial interviews. Trump, on the other hand, he, he actually likes doing these things. The Bloomberg and There's no filibustering there, right? <laughs> well, no, he's crisp in it's his answers. It's all filibustered. Come on. No, Trump is crisp in his answers. David Sachs is delusional. Listen, I didn't see <clears throat> either of these interviews, and I imagine that Kamala Harris, being a politician, tried to avoid some questions or pivot to other pivot to other subject matters when she didn't like the question or whatever. That's what you're told to do if you're taking an interview, if you're running for office. But the idea that Trump didn't do some version of that, too, is fucking delusional. Anecdotes. <laughs> you can do, you can do the weave. You can do the anecdotes. But yeah. he's also very good at coming back on the interviewer when they get adversarial and the audience was with him. They gave him a standing ovation. He went for 64 minutes compared to her 26. I just think there's no comparison. I think Trump is someone who really So 26 minutes is a half hour. If you like include commercials, that's a long kind of half hour media hit into the lines and doing those interviews. I think Harris did it because she felt like what do you she think, asked what do, you, what do you think? Chima? You see it or no? You have any opinion? I watched the whole interview. It was clear in, in the interview, he mentioned the fact that he was being waved off, and then he said it after the fact as well. That's not alleged. I think that that did happen. I would say two things. I thought that she was composed, and she maintained her cool. So I think from a stylistic perspective, I thought that she did well. From a substance perspective, it was pretty lacking. Because if you actually listen to the answers, there there was just a ton of non-answers. And well, what were the questions? Basic questions we're not going to go back and watch this. Fuck that. A lot of people, even if you're not a swing voter, I think would probably want to know the answer to. Meaning, did she have any regrets about what's happened in the last three and a half years? Did she have any regrets about what she's done on the border? Has she not noticed that Biden was wavering before he was hot swap. I think that you could have predicted that these questions were going to come. So I think I was surprised that there wasn't a crisp answer that they had practiced for that. The second thing I'll say is then David is right. Everybody then gets very tribal in how they interpret it. I think I saw one tweet from Elon about how all of the newspapers characterized her interview with Brett Baer as quote unquote testy. And it was sort of like, that was the way that the mainstream media framed it. I suspect if somebody looked at how Trump's interview with Bloomberg. Well, they didn't want to call her a bitch, I guess. Good on them. It probably had some similar verbiage that was repeated there as well. So I think you are right, Jason, that the mainstream media can't be trusted to tell the truth. I would just encourage people to watch it. I think, like I said, stylistically, I think she did well. In rem so this channel has fucking almost three quarters of a million subscribers and this video got 375,000 views. Yo, y'all are the mainstream media. I mean, composed substantively, I think it was non-existent. Yeah, it would have been nice to have another debate between these two. She it's still totally can't honest. really explain how she's different than Joe Biden other than the fact that he's a white male and she's a woman of color. So beyond just sort of the superficial differences she well, can't the, there's a lot of differences but they they don't matter like she was a prosecutor which is a political position but he was like a politician his whole life like what do you mean different they're from the same party they're gonna have a similar platform she also would have a hard time fucking differentiating herself if, had it been bernie sanders policy level what she would do differently she's had so many opportunities to say that they asked her on the view they asked her on stephen colbert Brett Baer asked her in his way, and she still can't explain what she would do differently. And I think that is the fundamental problem she has in her campaign is 
voters still don't know who she is or what she would do. Yeah. What did you think of uh, J.D. Vance saying he wouldn't uh, have certified the election? They seem to be going after him on that over and over again. Sachs. You're the only person talking about that. No, no. Literally every interview. they've been So, David, about. excuse me. Weren't we just talking about people not an answering questions? This is supposed to be your friend on your podcast. And, and you're like, I'm not talking about that. Down the hall asking him. Not, I'm not the only person. I may have started it. But what did you think of him saying he wouldn't have started? That him? is kind of like when he's in a combative reporting yeah moment that is the question he gets a lot that's not yeah. that's not the interview i saw i saw him the interview he just did with martha raditz was she was saying that trump was exaggerating no, no, the question i asked you sax was i asked you sax about you're him fixated saying he on that whole thing. you're the only one who's so wait a minute they were just complaining weren't they just complaining about kamala harris not answering questions directly and now david sax is like david sax is like you're fixated on this issue just say that you think it's good that he said it or bad that he said it like on it. No one, no I, one, well, no one, who, journalist. what do you think? No one, who, no one who is persuadable, who doesn't have TDS cares about that topic anymore. What, what do you think Freeberg about him saying he wouldn't certify January 6th? It's not, it's not what they're asking JD. If you want to talk about interviews that JD Vance has done, talk about the one that's actually going viral right now. And that was the interview he did with Martha Raddatz, where she starts saying that, you know, we've only had a few of these apartment buildings taken over by foreign gangs. And he's like, do you realize what you're saying? You know, there's no comeback from that. He destroyed her. It was very compelling what he did. It was In every compelling. interview he does. That's because like she that. fucked up. Yeah. There's no apartment buildings getting taken over by foreign gangs. I mean, she was basically saying that she spoke to, what was it, the city manager. And she's like, he said only a handful of buildings have been taken over. <laughs> and J.D. Vance was like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Only One a handful many. of buildings. Like, isn't yeah, it? She fucked up probably. More than zero, like too much or anything more than one is obviously a problem. Like. It was just such an obvious rebuttal to the, the narrative that they're kind of over-exaggerating a particular issue. I have no data on this, but he was very compelling in that uh, response. I thought it was pretty strong. But I will say, like, generally, neither candidate seems to be introducing a new message or seems to be introducing new content. They're just kind of standing up, you know, kind of repeating things that they've said, showing that they can handle and manage different kind of combative reporting tactics and... That's kind of what's going on. And everyone seems to have made up their mind. I, don't, I see a lot of people on both sides say, again, this side, this person did great. My person did great against this combative reporter. And the other person did poorly against their combative reporter. And everyone's kind of biased in their view. I, it just feels like this election's baked and we should just go to the polls and be done. Yeah. I what did you think, Freeberg, though? But, but there's, you... there's no October surprise coming out, right, Sax? Chama, Jay, oh, Jay Kelly, three like, weeks. Yeah, anything yeah. can happen. But there hasn't been anything, right? Like, that's kind of... The shocking moment yet this month but right? freeberg the question i was going to ask you is yeah. since you're not like hosting trump you know fundraisers do you think what did you think when jd vance said he didn't think that trump lost the 2020 election does that concern you at all um there's no there's no way to answer this um with with the kind of clean framing i think you're looking for what, Wait, what why from JD is that he wants the reporter and the people that he's talking to and I hear this from him yeah. to zoom out a little bit and recognize that there are significant control and uh, control systems and biases that he believes and others believe are strongly affecting the election process and as a result the election outcome <clears throat> and I think that that message but, but, but that's that's like a <clears throat> we're doing that's like a like a like a mott and bailey kind of like are of course there's problems with elections there's problems with any system that's catering to hundreds of millions of people but are they significant in so far as they're going to affect the outcome the answer has been no the answer has been that they're the amount of irregularities is actually a lot less than even i think even people most people who trust the system think there are uh is lost because people want him to say Trump lost the election, you're not admitting it, you're bad. But those people also aren't hearing the point that he's making, which is that there are biases. Mm. And we heard these biases what are they? Way with Democrats in prior elections as well, where they highlighted that they believe that there were biases with respect to misinformation being amplified on social media. And then the next election cycle. Yeah, but the thing with that is that everybody conceded their election. They, like, <clears throat> this is... This is dumb. He's referring to Hillary going around talking about uh, the 2016 election afterward. Uh, she conceded on the election night. 
step in and influence what was being changed on those social media platforms. And so there's this big f kind of war, media war going yeah, on that's what through I mean, social that's media mean. platforms. And I think that that's what both sides are highlighting is their big concern. And now there's this other big concern about is there appropriate voter verification that the people who are voting and it's a it's a it's a question to ask that shouldn't be dismissed it is a good question to ask yeah so except question, that the fucking people that run the elections in county after county and state after state <clears throat> even republican states have given you the answer given you all the answer you just don't like it person who doesn't have a uh, like a, a strong bias for a, a political party here I feel like I want to hear answers to those questions. <laughs> like, what, you know, what is the structure of how the, the, the way that most people are getting their media today, which is through social media platforms? What is the mechanism for censorship? What is the mechanism for filtering for moderation and be public and transparent? Yo, y'all invested in all of those companies. Maybe you should tell us. But, and then separately, what are the mechanisms for for deciding who gets to vote and how they yeah. get to vote. And I think those are both. Uh, who gets to vote is a uh, fucking everybody that meets the requirements, how they get to vote. Now you have a plethora of uh, ways. Like I vote, I just vote by mail. because It's fucking easy. It gives me more time to look at my ballot. If I'm unsure about something, I'm not like, <clears throat> cause there's some pressure with being at the polls, right? If you're voting in person and there's a long line behind you and you're unsure about something, you probably feel pressured to kind of keep it moving. So that's one of the great things about uh, getting your ballot mailed to you. Uh, when I lived in Campbell, I lived a two-minute walk from the polling place, so I actually went to the polling place to drop off my mail-in ballot. Um, but here, I don't even know where the fucking polling place is, so I'm just going to drop it in the mail. But, like, who gets to vote? Uh, everybody. Everybody who meets the requirements and registered. Good things to ask. I would just like to take a step back and say that that was one of the most incredible answers I've ever heard, Freeberg. Unfortunately, it may not land except your or, except your fucking both side except your it's like it's like saying, well, there's people who think the earth is flat and we should really give them a fair hearing because they deeply believe this. And it's like, well, no, like you're you're not finding except for that Tina Peters lady who just got busted. You're not finding officials in the system saying that anything's wrong other than like the kinds of anomalies you might expect with counting, you know, hun over 100 million votes. What was it? close to 120 million votes, 130 million votes. There's going to be some irregularities. There's going to be some anomalies in the system, but you're not having anybody who's actively involved in this saying that there's big problems with it because there's just not, they're never able to, they're not even able to point to any fucking individuals who voted when they weren't supposed to They're when they, when they are able to, a lot of times it's people who are on probation or parole or felons who tried to register when they are in a state that doesn't allow felons to vote. They were just mistaken. The, the fraud that happens in our election system is on the money side, baby. There's, there's all kind of election fraud going on, but that's not the same thing as uh, grandma voted twice. The reductive masses, but okay. it was exceptionally powerful and thoughtful. Thank you. Yeah, that's I what think I'm here for Chamath. <laughs> here for you. <laughs> well, I, 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 the, I mean, independent of who wins, we need to get this uh, rules of elections really tight starting next year i think make it a federal holiday require people to have id that doesn't seem like such a big deal i don't know so, so when i register here in California, as people call it my identity is verified it's verified at the point of registration they verify my name and my address and that i'm uh that i'm able to vote that i'm eligible to vote and then they mail me my ballot and then I mail it back in. If you're doing mail-in ballots, you have to do voter ID or voter, uh, you have to decide who's eligible to vote at the time of registration. Because I can't, what am I going to photocopy my ID and send it in with my ballot? What else should happen? Federal holiday. Well, right make it now, you've got Biden's DOJ is literally suing the state of Virginia, which is required by Virginia law to clean the voter rolls of illegal immigrants. And they've been doing that. Uh, okay. So in Virginia, how many um, people who are here without their papers were on the voter rolls? I'm guessing not many. Cause if you're here, think about this Think about if you're here without your papers, right? Why would you alert anyone to where the fuck you live? Why would you like, think about, think about how, think about how stupid you're, 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 breaking the law by registering to vote and 
when you register, you have to give them information about you. So you're just drawing them a map to where you're at. You're drawing like you're drawing La Migra or whatever, a fucking map to where you're at. Has sued to stop that. In California, like you said, we now have a new law signed by Gavin Newsom to make it illegal to ask for voter ID. So Democrats seem. Well, that's to be because no, no, California is a fucking mail-in state. They fucking verify who you are at the time of registration. This has been the the most common place that you register to vote. If you don't just do it by mail or online or whatever, is the DMV. You do it maybe when you renew your driver's license or something. I mean, the integrity of elections, not fortifying it. So when you ask, you know, why do Republicans distrust elections? Maybe it has something to do with the way that Democrats are acting. But I agree with you. I think that cleaning up the voter rolls, having a minimum standard for voter verification. is So how do you do that? I'm asking these people, David Sachs, how do you do that with mail-in ballots? I'm serious. Do I fucking photo? Do, I'm serious. Do I photocopy my ID and send it in with my ballot? Do you want my thumbprint? I'd be happy to put my fucking thumbprint on my ballot. I don't know. How do you do all? How do you do this with mail-in ballots? I don't understand. That I think should be done. According to the Constitution, the states basically run their own elections, but it doesn't make sense to me that in a one-party machine politics state, where basically one party controls the state, that they could set up a system that effectively entrenches their power forever in federal elections. It just seems to me that the federal government has a compelling interest that must be constitutional in ensuring a minimum standard of honesty in federal elections. So I think it would be great to do something about this next year. I think that if you want people to stop questioning elections or engaging in election denial, you need to make the elections above reproach. So let's do that. So anyway, Heritage Foundation, uh, which is obviously right leaning, has a bunch of election fraud cases they've been documenting and they basically cannot come up with like um actual evidence that this is i like this guy he's like see you're not that that's the thing is like okay if it, 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 we're david Sachs is doing feels over reels here right he's like well if people don't trust the election because people like me keep telling them that they don't shouldn't trust the election first of all you're doing like a, a fucking uh, self-licking ice cream cone kind of there but also like it just feels over real. This guy's going to bring up that the Heritage Foundation has looked and tried to find this, and they're finding so few examples of like in per, the kind of in-person voter fraud that some kind of voter ID law would, would prevent. Also, I got to ask, how the fuck do you do what they're talking about with mail-in voting? With mail-in voting, you have to verify someone's identity at the time of registration, and then you send them a ballot. changing any election results but we should make it above reproach i agree all right our boy elon had a, a big week tesla unveiled two new concepts at its we robot event and elon elon caught a 23 story rocket the starship here's uh, the robo taxi and the robo bus both of them look really awesome and uh, well, i mean the robo taxi just looks like a car the the robo bus looks like it would have a hard time with a speed bump one of the so the, I think this is the fifth starship or the fourth launch. Fifth, oh, the fifth, God, right? So and then incredible. Look at this! It's Unbelievable. so incredible. It's like chopsticks catching. Forget a about whatever your building. issues are with Elon <laughs> and his politics. Just to appreciate, and we can talk about why this is so important in yeah. the segment. But technically, the achievement of this, like skyscraper falling out of the sky and perfectly wow. aligning itself to go into that chopstick catching device. It wow. is an absolute marvel of human ingenuity. I mean, just, and the work and the effort that people put into this over, you know, several decades, it's just such an incredible feat. Look at this thing. I don't know if this you This all in spite of apartheid, Clyde, because my understanding is that SpaceX, the, the people that, that, like, he's not really helping. Totally. From every angle. Every angle. And yeah. so, the reason this is so important is because these things cost a lot of money. And when they land here, you can clean them up. And I guess his goal is to have them take off again after he fills them with propellant an hour later, Freeberg. So on a Sunday. No, that's crazy. This thing is not going to take off an hour later. <clears throat> what would probably happen here is, uh, and it's smart, you would reuse the components in a new rocket. You might use the frame of this, but you're going to have to replace a lot of the components. The fucking thing 
like the, the, the physics that just happened to that thing mean that you're not going to be able to just like refuel it. Like it's a fucking 747 and then send it back up. Face says, this is extraordinary. What, uh, you know, if this works and yeah, you, you can start to be more rockets, specific, then, yeah. you don't want it to have feet. Hmm. A, it's heavy. And then B, you have to lift them up in a way that just complicates the entire refueling and cycle time process. So by catching it, you put it right back into place and just go again. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Right, you just catch it and go again. I can kind of walk through these numbers. So obviously the big objective over time is how cheap can you get it to put material into space? We need a lot of material to go into space if we're going to do things in space. Oh, maybe we should stop. I don't know. We should fucking, we should maybe focus a little more inward right now. Plenty on Mars. And so this shows you over time, the cost per kilogram, which is the key metric in this industry to launch material into low. Yeah, but that's really interesting. They're not showing us what these other dots are. They're also not giving us a year, right? Like Saturn (laughs) five, that's an old fucking rocket. And the shuttle, that's, that's weird too, because the shuttle is a pretty substantial craft attached to rockets going into space. Orbit. And you can see here how SpaceX has dramatically reduced the cost. I remember when the small sat era began in the 2010s. Do you guys remember all these startups that were starting to build like little small sats and put them up to do imaging and comms and stuff? When this took off, it was about 10,000 bucks a kilogram to put a, a small sat into space or to put material into space. And then SpaceX has dropped the cost to the point that it's now close to $1,000 a kilogram. So a 10x reduction in cost in just the last decade or so. And that's why SpaceX... So 10,000, 10x reduction, 10x less doesn't mean anything. Would it be one-tenth as much? Because 10 times less, see, 10, 10 times less seems... I don't know why people talk like that. They would be one-tenth. Launch market. But Elon's always said that $1,000 a kilogram is too high. But his objective has been to get the cost down to 10 bucks a kilogram. Because at 10 bucks a kilogram, you could launch what some people estimate is needed to get to Mars, which is about half a million tons of material and people to set up a colony on Mars. God, why don't, why, like, yo, this is, this is so crazy. We're not setting up a fucking colony on Mars. Okay. Like, I'm not saying humans never will, but let's, let's, let's be real about the amount of, the amount of work that needs to go into this and the, 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 the amount of time between now and even just breaking ground on such a thing. Let's think about that. We'll all be dead and gone. We're looking, I don't know, if it ha- if if the first bit of that started happening within 100 years from now, I'd be fucking shocked. I'm not saying humans aren't amazing and that the rockets being made by SpaceX aren't good. I'm just saying that it's a that's a fucking that's a big task. At, you know, half a million tons of material at, at 10 bucks a kilogram. So if you look at this new Starship and Starship heavy booster, it's about 150, 200 ton payload. The booster holds, you know, 3,400 tons of propellant. And uh, the cost of that propellant is pretty low. You know, it's, uh, it's only about a million dollars in fuel. So then if you can get the cost of the booster and the Starship down enough and you can reuse it enough and you amortize the cost of making that device over the the lifetime of of the device the cost per launch comes down and that's what brings the cost per kilogram down so the booster there's a group called payload and they do estimates on this so i won't speak out of turn in terms of like having inside knowledge but the payload has estimated that starship and the booster cost about 90 million bucks today and they think that they have a path to getting it down to 35 million so if you can reuse that thing 10 times that's a $3.5 million cost per launch. But that assumes that you, hold on, you don't have to, this, that, that assumes that it comes back and you don't have to do any fucking work on it. Let's say the thing's $9 million to create the first time. What do you think the cost of maintaining it is over 10 launches? Plus a million for fuel, you could easily see, and this thing can launch 200 tons. That's how you start to get to 10 bucks a kilogram over the next couple of years but it was critical to be able to reuse that heavy booster and that's what elon just demonstrated it's we can actually catch that heavy booster refuel it and launch it an hour later and if you can do that over over no 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 no. he demonstrated that okay spacex the engineers at spacex demonstrated that they can launch it and catch it 
and ain't nobody demonstrate that it's just good to go again in an hour like a fucking like a like an airplane nobody demonstrated that again you're spending 10 bucks a kilogram to put material into space you can get fuel into space and then get those starships to fly off to mars and deliver all this material including setting up a base that would allow you to actually make more fuel on mars because everything we need to make fuel is on mars so Wait, what the beginning of- i'm sorry what I mean, sure, the fucking raw elements are there, but what what the shit is this guy talking about? The next series of really important milestones that'll hopefully get humanity onto Mars. It was just so amazing to see it come together. Yeah, the economics are legit. I mean, this is like a thousand x reduction in cost. It's incredible. Yeah. What do you mean by a thousand x reduction? Does he mean one one thousandth? We're gonna do some, I guess, new stuff with Starlink. Some even lower Earth orbit satellites that go even faster. Uh, and have less latency so that's going to be super exciting starlink's apparently i mean i know everyone here is a share, shareholder in spacex but starlink's running at four million subs right now that's like a hundred bucks a month four, four million, million subs. subs and if you do the math i mean how many people have isps that are slower than starlink right how many people well, the problem that? isn't the fucking the throughput the throughput seems okay on starlink although the upload's pretty bad the the problem is latency phone providers that they're paying roughly the same amount that aren't as good as starlink if we can get satellite to phone and you can get starlink more broadly available this could be a hundred million subscriber business i mean this could be absolutely it could be the largest businesses on the on the on the earth it could be the largest subscription business in the history of humanity i think the largest ones right now are like netflix you know 250 disney plus 150 verizon 100 million so yeah, it could be hundreds of millions of subscribers. It it's could even crazy. be... What about, about, about AT&T? In the we could look back one day and be like... What about PG&E? Run all this copper wire everywhere. <laughs> like, well, we don't need uh, it. Uh, yeah, obviously. It's for like sure. crazy. Especially if it can like, get it to... It would be like crazy that we were like ever... I mean, the whole nutty thing about this past week, it's like we could look back one day and be like, why did we ever drive cars? And why do we ever have copper wire laid all over the earth to like move internet signals around? You know this uh this efficiency gain that's going to be realized over the next decade is and just incredible just incredible chamath any thoughts on the uh, robo van or the well the the copper well i mean now it's fiber but the backbone of the internet is uh, hardwired cyber cab the model two i guess some people are calling it but it's you know the cyber cab specifically not calling it number two and it doesn't have a steering wheel. oh it's probably number two I would have bought two of those immediately if it had a steering wheel and pedals. So I want to drive it. Yeah, it looks like the hybrid of like a Model Y and the Cybertruck. So I kind of really love the aesthetics of it. So oh, beautiful. Wow. Yeah, you like it? My, my, my reaction was actually, I don't know, just seeing these releases now over 10 or 15 years, plus of knowing him, nothing... It's, it's, I guess it's like not that surprising. I mean, it's, I, it's weird to say, like, I just expect him and his teams to figure it out. Like, they're just all so good. It's, and the thing to remember, it's not just him that's incredible, but. So also like the Starlink, like people, and we're all talking about fiber and our internet speeds in the chat. People, people don't understand that Starlink and like your, your 5G, it all relies on a fucking, a network of fiber, a terrestrial fiber network at some point. It's a kind of technical and operational wonder kind people for sure and that's just that's just a really special thing so i had had that reaction which was i was really proud and happy for them for the team yeah for sure for the team and for him these guys are like incredibly fearless fail bigly right yeah if you're gonna fail fail bigly yeah and then the other thing that i thought was crazy was how many people were trying to dunk on him this weekend and yeah, that surprised it's weird. me weird it, why is it wait it's because weird that people were trying to dunk on elon musk i think that they were personalizing a lot of anxiety that they are feeling through these companies successes which didn't make much sense to me well in fairness he did hurt some people's feelings with posting of memes so <laughs> yeah i mean it's it makes God, imagine sense. wanting imagine listen I know this term isn't great, but I don't really have another term. Imagine dick riding Elon Musk. Like, and it's like the guy's like going to save 30,000 road deaths a year in the United States with self driving, and people are losing their minds over a couple of memes or who he's voting for for president. I don't think you have to worry about that. 
you can just look at the products they speak for themselves anything um Sachs, any response uh, on the uh, on the tesla front any thoughts on the the bus or optimus i mean they're both very exciting products i don't think i've got a lot to add so that ren if that rendering of that bus is accurate that is a useless bus that shit is like a low rider bus the bus is like got fucking what six inches of ground clearance or something like what the fuck happens to that bus if it if there's if the road is rough like what is he t it looks like the <clears throat> looks like the, in at disneyland they have like the fucking thing that's like the people movers but those are on tracks yeah i love the bus freeberg i think that thing could become like mobile homes are you know adus and you could just send them to Wait, can you can we buy them or no well no not right now but i mean they're not even going to be street legal dude they're too low to the ground might be that's a train that's right that's like a way. that's like a next next generation light rail design kids in one <laughs> I, well, I need it for all my kids yeah well see if this was a platform like the mercedes sprinter vans have become uh, that you see oh a lot god. in europe then oh my god. you could wow. buy an empty one of these it's got <laughs> enough battery life well, well, you'd, need like to, you'd need to you need to raise it up you'd need to raise it off the ground like why is these people like i'm not a car expert or a bus expert but you look at a bus and it's like it's got all kinds of ground clear like this is this thing is not going to survive in like a place like san francisco or new york city Take last one. a month and then let's say you had your in-laws over and there was one that was set up as like a one bedroom you could click on airbnb or you know tesla b and b press a button and the thing could drive to your driveway you could rent it for a week and then it could leave or mm -hmm. let's say a thousand people or ten thousand people were displaced mm, but folks like you have a big ass house like if your in-laws come to visit if you have a big enough house if you have room you just put them up in one of your rooms and if they if you don't you go hey uh that's fine that you want to come visit we don't really have space you guys are gonna have to get a hotel room because of a hurricane freeberg you could send a hundred thousand of these to the parking lots at walmart which typically does a good job in, in feeding people and getting them supplies after hurricanes since those are so ubiquitous you could put a hundred of these in every parking lot but how's it going to get there how, like if there's a hurricane like trees are going to be knocked over this thing doesn't even look like it could fucking go over a small rock or people who are fleeing <clears throat> also wait a minute what is he talking after the Walmart's just Walmart's not going to just feed everybody after the hurricane. The what? What if the Walmart's damaged? Disasters to stay. So I thought that was like the most compelling product of the whole thing for me was the possibility. I thought that little self-driving car was if 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 real, um, way more compelling than this bus. The, the fucking <clears throat> I don't know. Like, there's no way. There's no fucking way because it's not like Elon is going to be for like paying people paying taxes to improve the roads Sled like a skiff that you could do anything you want with would be really exciting for society so congratulations to the team and it's it's going to take a while but I, I i could see them having that robo also, taxi I think, I think congrats to amid he just got promoted i saw that yeah he's in charge of all ai i think he's in charge of all manufacturing and sales in north america oh okay well there it is so uh, shout so out to amid after yeah i think it's that's because who the, the if i'm not mistaken the person who was doing that before fucking resigned i have uh, i have big news i just bought my first tesla nobody oh, cares did. dude did you go with a yeah. plaid model s model s plaid yeah yeah that's i uh test drove it for car. two weeks and sold itself and, and yeah, are I you was, using the fsd i use fsd mm -hmm. every day i use fsd um, and it was like really impressive so super impressive I, I've, wow this guy's not long for this world is he couple times over the years and i never really never really worked for me the quality just didn't feel like what i like given what i had before the car wise you were an audi guy right but audi guy yeah, yeah. always loved audi guys are and so guys. I was, yeah that's yeah that's like because anyway. audi makes high quality cars it's uh it's a big milestone i really I, mean, I thought the fsd was the selling and then the speed on the plat is is just insane it's better than my rs7 like i um it's incredible with all of my teslas i put it in chill mode because when it's in that plaid mode or whatever like coffee goes it's flying, my favorite i love kids, it I get on the, but if you have passengers uh, the kids in the back seat will get like literally nauseous because it's too yeah. fast you gotta be you gotta yeah. be uh, careful with the passengers there so. sir do you know how an accelerator pedal works 
<laughs> no matter how much fucking power the car has, if you don't want it to scare the people in the car, don't press the accelerator pedal down very far. It was awesome. It's awesome. All right. Well, there you have it. Robo Taxi Star. We didn't get to it last week. We almost put the show back a day or two just to do it. In other news, Uber is exploring a bid to purchase Expedia. Breaking news. This was oh great Expedia. Bit. Like every time I travel, I I check Expedia. Not be not because they always have the best deals, <clears throat> but because they have like the most information. And so I'll pay a little bit more than I would on some other site because if I go to Expedia, I'm getting like good information about the fucking hotels. Expedia is a pretty good site actually. And I don't get opportunity to travel much now that I'm a fucking podcaster. <clears throat> but like when I go to the city, if I go to the city and want to spend a night or two, I'll just get it. I'll just, I'll be like, oh, I'd like to stay near the Castro. When Expedia gets me a hotel. I don't want Uber buying that. As we got here on the, the show, website works, said this was like very preliminary third party talks and that there's no serious talks going on about this. Financial Times reported that advisors we're trying to look at if a deal structure would be possible between Uber and Expedia. Expedia has got a $20 billion market cap, they popped 8% on the news, obviously Uber, on the other hand, trading at 170 billion market cap or so that dropped 3%. If you didn't know, Dara was the CEO of Expedia from 2005 to 2017, he's still on the board. And it looks like this was a trial balloon. You know, Uber's two biggest businesses rides in Uber Eats. But they also do freight and train bookings. Dara's been pretty clear he wants to create freight and train bookings. By freight and tra by train bookings, it means it tells you that you could also take a bus. <laughs> Go on to Uber right now if you live in a city. It'll do. It'll do you a fuck it. It'll do you a solid and also tell you that there's a bus near you. <laughs> or like, oh, you're near Bart. You can take Bart. Which uh, Google Maps. And uh, my local with transit511.org um, has done for ages. Also, you could just get a transit map. Super app like you have in train China, bookings. Get the fuck out markets. of here. Speed has got a lot of cool products. Hotels.com, Orbit, Travelocity, or, uh, and I think the most interesting one, Freeberg, you and I were talking about this is VRBO, Vacation Rental by Owner. It was like Airbnb before Airbnb existed. And if you look at this chart, since Dara left, the Dara effect, Expedia has gone exactly sideways. So the revenue has grown modestly. What do you think of this deal? Chama, I'll just go right to you with this one since you like to... Stupid. Stupid. Okay. There you have it, folks. Reason Thank you. Don't, don't, don't buy Expedia. Uh, Expedia is like a legacy, like, like a legacy like web 1.0 company that provides a service and makes their money by charging the fucking hotels to get them the customers. And then you pay a little bit more from Expedia because they offer a better service than most of the other things in their, in their, uh, in their category. This is like how, um, what is, what are we looking at? We're looking at a, a fucking actual business, right? <laughs> you can tell I've been listening to Ed Zitron's show a lot lately. You're looking at an actual fucking business that provides a service to me and to the hotel. And uh, the ostensibly the hotel pays a fee for it, but it's baked into the price that I got it from Expedia. But then sometimes Expedia has deals that you can't get from the hotel because they got to deal with them. Like I fuck it, this is an actual business that actually makes money. Like they, they like they turn a profit. They've been profitable for quite some time. Please get your grubby venture capital money losing hands off of this fucking business. I mean, this is a $20 billion market cap business. You probably have to pay a control premium of 50%. So the question is, if you were going to spend $30 billion today in the public markets, what would you spend it on? And I think the most important lens that you have to use to answer that question is, what reinforces a moat that I have while also being inoculated from the risks of AI? And... I what? cannot think inoculated from the risks of AI, a more fragile business model than the UI layer on top of widely available data. So the problem that Expedia, well, no, has, no Expedia, they've been around for so long. They probably have deals with Hilton with, um, like the double tree. Uh, they have deals probably with the Waldorf Astoria. Like they, they have deals with the hotel companies that they've had for 
decades. That's their business. They have people who have been their customers for decades. As is the same that Booking and a bunch of these other folks have, which is that the principal heartbeat of the company, flight information and other things, are licensed to them by third parties. And so what they are is a UI and a front door. I think it's way too early in the evolution of AI to know that that's safe. And in fact, I think a more reasonable assumption is that those things are pretty fragile. And part of what may so, explain the so if is, if I don't want <clears throat> I don't want some fucking hallucinating ass fucking fucking open AI fucking chat GPT trying to fucking book my hotel for me. There's none of that. It's automated. But when you book a fucking hotel at Expedia, you say I'd like to book this, and then Expedia goes and makes sure that nobody else booked the fucking room, and then books the room for you and charges you, and then fucking gives most of the money to the fucking gives most of the money to the fucking hotel company and then keeps a little for themselves and that's all it does. And that's what it's supposed to do. And it does it well. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't, it, what the fuck does he mean? Is AI going to come in? I'm like, um, like, all right. So Anthropic, can you book me a hotel? And then Anthropic would just be like, here's information about hotels. And half of it would be false the stock is that i think people are anticipating a world where for example i don't know if you saw but perplexity launched something this week it's just in test mode Ooh, perplexity as we covered on how the tech are you that should be coming out tomorrow um perplexity just got sued by like every major fucking publisher from like wired to the new york times to the wall street journal to the new york post for not only fucking just stealing articles and giving them to people as if they were like AI generated answers, but then also falsely attributing claims to these publications. They whitelisted me into it, but it's basically a checkout concept. So you tell perplexity what you would like it to buy, and then it will go and complete the transaction for you. So but, uh, in the that's stupid. Of bookings, you I tell Amazon what I would like to buy and then it shows it to me and then I just buy it. Why do I want to add another layer in there that's going to make some guesses? I'm like, oh, I need a new microphone. Uh, I'm a big fan of Sure. And then fucking here in the mail comes a Blue Yeti. It's like, you fucker. You could go directly to United because A, Perplexity will just show you all of the flights. They'll show you the exact prices. And then it'll go and execute that for you with your payment method. Right. But if you know that you like, let's say you are like a rewards member with United or whatever, you log into United, you tell it where you're at, you tell it where you want to go. And when you go to go there, it gives you the information on the flight, you go book and you pay for it. Why the fuck do you need an intermediary for that? <clears throat> Booking a flight has never been easier. You could use something like Expedia, but if, if you know, there's people who fly enough that it's to their advantage to use the same airline whenever they can, because they rack up miles and. You get free upgrades and stuff. Well, I don't think the AI is going to do that for you. You just log into the fucking website. Why do I need another layer of abstraction between me and Southwest Airlines if I'm just trying to fly to LA to do some Coke or something? It looks like that where these companies have the money to pay for the data feeds. The existing V1.0 generation UIs, I think, are in trouble. So it would just be a very bad capital allocation decision. Now, that's okay to get things wrong, but not for $30 billion wrong. You can probably do it for a couple hundred million dollars wrong, or maybe even a billion dollars wrong, because you can absorb that as a $150 or $60 billion company, but $30 billion is too big of a price to pay for that kind of risk. I would agree with you, and there's other things they could buy, like WeRide or Pony AI and a bunch of these AI companies that are yeah, buy all the fucking yeah that's great fuck fuck Uber I I think that buying Expedia would be they'd make money on it because what they could do is just be like Expedia buy Uber and then just leave it alone and fucking take the money off the top right but I, instead they should buy some fucking a pony AI or whatever that just fucking hemorrhages money and sucks down a bunch of electricity <laughs> so now they're just losing more money than they were already fucking fuck yeah. Do that. Do that, Uber. Double down on that. Freeberg, the one thing you and I talked about was kind of VRBO, which is a very cool marketplace. And that feels directly in the Uber kill zone. What do you think about them just maybe carving out and buying VRBO and having an Airbnb? Uh, Wait, why don't they just buy Waymo? Why don't they just go to Google and give them $30 I, I, billion dollars of Uber stock and just... Because they, the, FTC will, the FTC won't let them. 
a better idea? I think that's what's going to happen. I've been hearing rumblings of that. So. so I think that Dara knows Expedia better than anyone. He ran the business for, what, a decade or, or so? Yep. And so More. he knows how that business operates. And so if he's looking at this thing and the stock price has been flat roughly since he left in 2017, if you look at the underlying... But that, what if the stock price performance? has just been flat because like it's not that exciting of a business? And they're just making they're making a little bit of money, and they're nobody's fucking super excited. Like the what? Then what? Fucking that's fine. Meant you could kind of start to construct a rationale for buying Expedia this cheap, and it would be very accretive to Uber, even if there are these big strategic risks on the horizon. So just to give you some numbers on it all, Uber has got about 150 million monthly active users. Expedia has not about many. 45, 50 million worldwide? customers a year that use the service and pay for stuff. So there's a real opportunity to think about the Uber customer base that's installed as being almost an opportunity to market to them Expedia services and cross-sell. So Expedia on an annualized basis is spending about $8 billion a year in sales and marketing and about $720 million a year in G&A costs. So, and they're running about 3 billion EBITDA right now, run rate. So if you cut about half the G&A in an acquisition, because you don't need all the people that overlap with Uber's people, you know, and you cut about 30% of the sales and marketing dollars because you can cross sell into the Uber install base, you could see a scenario where you could increase Expedia's EBITDA by 75 to 100%, maybe getting it as high as $6 billion. And while Expedia's market cap trades at two, 20 billion, this is off of, you know, obviously the recent news that they might get acquired. If you kind of assume a 40, 50% price premium to the last 90 day average of the stock price, which is kind of typical or common for a deal like this, they're probably paying 26 billion for the company. And they got about 4 billion in net cash. So you're kind of paying about 22 billion enterprise value to buy Expedia. So 22 billion of enterprise value. And if you can bump the EBITDA up to 6 billion a year, that's a pretty low multiple. I mean, you could kind of see yourself rationalizing this just from a financial basis that you're paying four times EBITDA to buy this thing. Hmm. And Dara knows this thing and he would have great command over what needs to be done over there. And he would have a great... Nothing. It fucking works and it makes money. Leave it alone. What's gone wrong. Hmm. And there's a lot of interesting assets inside of Expedia. VRBO is a great one that's been under monetized and underutilized. I don't know if you've used the UX on VRBO versus Airbnb. There's obviously some influence Dara could have with people that he knows well that could go in and fix that that interface and make it a better service and no, the interface is fine starts to step in and hotels maybe integrate better like with fucking go to the expedia so website and you can fucking you're like i live i'm here and i need to be here for a week and fucking fucking just like a fuck 30 seconds later or the fucking thing gives you all these options including flight hotel rental car it fuck t gives you everything you need baby and then you can customize each one as you need i don't know what the fuck else you're supposed to be able to do with it it does everything that it's supposed to do. It does it quickly. It does it well. And they show up in a more ubiquitous way. There's other things that Expedia does, like build vacation packages and travel packages that are high margin products that they sell that are a little bit different than what you're used to with a, just booking a flight. Booking flights makes no money for anyone. But vacation... No, they make a little money on that. And so theoretically, Expedia could be smarter about how they build vacation packages and personalize them for families. And that's where they can make real margin, like 20, 30% margin. So I could see a story where this all starts to click for the board at Uber saying, maybe it makes sense. Dara knows what he's talking about. We could buy this thing for four times, you know, pro forma EBITDA. This could be hugely accretive, accretive for us. So I think that's why this is happening, why this conversation may be hmm. happening. That, that's just me trying to understand. I think it's a good steal, man. You know, what the rationale might be. Can you just go back and explain how would they drive up EBITDA so much? So they're spending about um, $8 billion a year run rate on sales and marketing at Expedia right now. And Uber's got 150 million active installed users that are using this, the, the Uber services every month. Okay, so this is stupid because, like, <clears throat> this, what he's saying here probably, like, assumes that none of the Uber users are also already familiar with Expedia or would use Expedia to book. I'd be willing to bet most of those people know what the fuck Expedia is and might use it to book their fucking shit. The so idea would be actually, customers, yeah. Yeah, beyond actually users, paying customers. Yeah. So, if Uber could cross sell some number of Expedia services to their installed base at Uber, which they could test and you know do a little experiment and see if it works, 
they may be able to reduce the marketing dollars that Expedia is spending to acquire customers through other third party sources like Google and Bing and other places. So there's a rationale. That's where I think the logic breaks down. I don't think Uber customers want to be cross sold on booking a hotel. See, this is where yeah. I think like MBA thinking is very different than product thinking. Well, no, he he's sort of he's sort of right, but for the wrong reason. It's if you're if you if you're using Uber, you know what the fuck Expedia is, and you might check it if you're going on vacation already, right? This isn't like some. It's not like Uber has this um, 150 million uh, monthly active users that just don't use any other services. I'd be willing to bet like only 30 or 40 million of those people. If, uh, I don't know what the what the percentage is in the U.S. I don't know how popular Expedia is outside of the U.S., but I'm guessing like 60, 70 percent of those people would already check Expedia if they were about to do a vacation, if they use those services at all. MBA looking at this would say, well, you know, Expedia and Uber are both in the travel business. Their apps both involve booking trips, so we can right. we can cross sell Expedia from Uber and then cut Expedia's marketing budget. I think that's how an MBA would sort of hand wave over it. I think the way like a product manager would look at this is to say, what does the user want to do? Hmm. And I know that when I use the Uber app, I just want to basically make a couple of clicks, set my destination, get my car, and then move on. And that's sort of what Expedia does too, right? I mean, it's a little more complicated, but you you do the same thing on the Expedia website. See, like this guy's not wrong. He's just, I don't think he's necessarily right, but yeah, the people, if you're like, okay, first of all, so Uber has no idea that you're about to take a vacation. And so they'd have to add some shit to the fucking app to be like, Hey, are you going on vacation? And then you click it. Where does it take you? Does it take you to the Expedia website? All right. Fucking. All right. That you didn't really do anything. Right. Cause somebody was going to check one of those fucking websites. Anyway, if you're already out of town and Uber notices you're out of town, it's like, you need a hotel. You're like, well, no, I already have one. It's like how, if you're like shopping for a couch, as soon as you buy a couch from somebody, now your Facebook, Twitter feed mostly Facebook are filled with ads for more couches. And there was a, there was a product initiative a few years back at Uber where they tried to capture the user's attention during the ride. And they, you know, they added that's like right. this, yeah, this they had that whole ad thing that adds, yeah, that that's making ads, a ton of money. Yeah, and and it's um, actually printing well, no, it was money like, it them. was like an entertainment stream or something right. inside the app. Like Uber should buy grinder because I, you know what I do while, while I'm in an Uber, I check my grinder. So who should buy Grinder? They could use the fucking the, that fucking that bus or whatever, right? They could use that bus and have like the the, the Uber Tesla Grinder mobile hookup bus. Dialed it way back because I don't see it anymore. It was just clutter. Would you trust Dara's judgment on this, Sax? Like, if Dara were to think about what the Uber user would want, and he could rationalize some percentage of them they could cross sell Expedia services into. I mean, ultimately, I think it's it's his decision, right? Like, well, I mean, what believes. you're describing is basically a private equity play. Like right. Dar is going to come in as like a private equity buyer effectively. And he knows the business and will run it to reduce cost, may boost some revenue. And maybe there is a justification for that. But if you're trying to justify it based on cross selling, I don't think users of the Uber app want to be cross sold when they book a taxi. Okay. They just, right. It's actually the other way around. The fucking Expedia users might want to be cross sold when they go to <clears throat> like, if they, if they're out of town or whatever, and they were like, maybe they're not necessarily an Uber user. They'd want to be cross sold a ride somewhere. Does the car, you've got the fucking car in this case, literally going the wrong way. Right. I know people who don't really use Uber. What when they travel, they use the shit out of it. So if you travel to like a, a, a city, you should just take public transit as efficiently as possible. And just to finish the point I was making on that whole entertainment stream that they had, they dialed that product way back because it got in the way. You'd be, you know, in the Uber app trying to figure out how to change your destination or something, and all of a sudden you're being shown like some entertainment product. It's not what users wanted, um, and it was always kind of a a banana's idea to think that just because the user books an Uber that you own their attention during that ride, because during that ride, you're really competing with every app on the iPhone, right? I yeah, mean, particularly Grindr. I'm telling you, Uber needs to buy, gr uh, don't buy Grindr, but <clears throat> a smart play would be to buy Grindr. Offer like hookup services. And that's the problem. Like if you could book your car, from inside of Grinder, 
where the other person just says yes and gives the Uber their location or whatever if you're trying to hook up. Now, that's some shit right there. Get in and out of the Uber app. It's about transacting efficiently. What about not the moment when you're, when you're riding in an Uber, but the moment when you say as an Uber user, hey, I need to book travel. I got to go on a vacation to Austin. I'm this never going to think poker. to go on my Uber app for that. The only time I open. But what if they put that feature in there? What if they had a tab no. that said book your travel here? You know, when I open the Uber app, when I want to hail a taxi, that's what it's well, like. That's I'm you, ready to but go. I, there are a large number of people who maybe don't have. They're also like, they're system. also just leaving out the fact that uh, anybody could just buy Expedia and just fucking take the money that the, the Expedia is making and just take it. Why aren't they talking about that? That would be the play. Uber's not profitable. Expedia is. Uber has a bigger market or market cap than Expedia. And that's because capitalism in its current form is crazy. And uh, so they would, I, they could just buy it. And then uh, take the money that, that Expedia makes. Their hotels in advance and like that would be most people, JKL. <laughs> I would not think to go into Uber to do that. It would just be clutter. Well, no, but they already have. So wait a minute. This is dumb too, because it wouldn't be cluttered because the Uber could be like hail a ride and you just, you just scroll down in a little bit in the Uber app and it could be like, are you, do you need to book travel? Do you need to book long, you know, long distance travel like this, this, this is not, this wouldn't ruin the Uber app. It'd just be another thing you can click inside of it. Like, what are these people talking about? <clears throat> if you're like at the top, it's the same and you just scroll a little bit and it's like, I'm traveling farther. I need an airplane. Com partnership. And then the Uber one membership has been growing pretty nicely and the advertising is doing a billion dollars a year. And that is just a money printing machine because you know, but Uber one keeps growing because they keep offering it to you free. Anybody else have this experience? They're like, hey, we'll give you two weeks of free Uber One, and it'll give you 20% off of this ride or 15% off of your food order. You're like, fuck yeah. And then you hopefully set a thing in your calendar to uh, deactivate it a couple days before it ends. That's why it's growing, because they, they keep offering that shit to me for free, because I never use Uber, and I'm trying not to use Uber Eats. I'll use Uber to like go see somebody because I don't have a car, and if it's too far to ride, and I don't want, it's too late maybe to take transit. I mean, y'all know what I'm doing. Um, but that's why the Uber one keeps, because they keep giving like, just like at first Amazon and they don't do it as much, but for a long time, Amazon prime, if you'd cancel and then you'd go to order something, they'd be like, Hey, do you want a free week of prime? You'd be like, fuck yeah, I'll take free delivery on this fucking thing. I just bought for black. You know that they're going to the four seasons, like these users who are, you know, they have a real ad business at Uber. Yeah. Yeah. The more Uber tries to promote some unrelated product. And what I mean by unrelated is it doesn't help you get to where you're going that moment. So Expedia that well, Expedia is longer term. They can add it. I can figure out exactly how to add it. You, you have all the fucking, you put in your destination and then Uber's like, Hey, that's really far. <laughs> you know, I'm like a fucking grand central station, New York city. Uber says that's really far. You're clearly looking for travel information. It's clutter in the app. What about Uber Eats, Sex? Yeah. Well, Uber no, Eats that, working pretty well. It's working great. Yeah. No, the cross promotion's working. That is highly related to it's basically booking a car to pick up some food. Uh, yeah. It's still the taxi business. But Yo, it's also a separate app. You could just do Uber Travel. There'd just be a third app you have from Uber. That wouldn't be annoying. Like, what the fuck are these people talking about? Why do they think they're going to integrate Expedia into like calling a car to go fuck somebody? It's basically. I think the hotel's integration is good. I know? think there's something here. We have gone through a cycle where apps and attention were highly consolidated with a few. Now the pendulum has swung the other way and apps are very narrow features that are really well described. Okay, so that's sort of where we are. That's why we have... Except for X, the everything billions app. ...billions of apps in the app store. The question is, does the pendulum swing back to these super apps? And I think the big question is not whether it swings back to the super apps, but whether there's a new substrate that puts... Like, let me think, let, like, literally, let's think about this for a second. <laughs> like, if you wanted to integrate travel into Uber, that would be fucking so easy. You just tell it where you're going and it's... It, and because on Uber, you can also schedule things, right? You say, I'd like to go here actually three days from now and i'd like to leave around three it lets you do that and if where you're going is hella far and you're like i'd like to go there next week uh, you uh, fucking like, it's a computer on the other end a server the cloud 
can figure out that you're like, wow, this isn't really a thing that we're going to send a car to pick you up for. Can't really drive a car to Hawaii, can we? And so they, <clears throat> you go, you, you hit the go button and it sends you to another fucking screen where it's like, oh, do you need a hotel? Do you just need a flight? Do you need a rental car? And then you just fucking basically you might as well just fucking send your ass to the Expedia website to be like, what the fuck? This is so easy to like integrate into this. This isn't the problem. You're not bothering anybody with this, right? It doesn't change my experience if I'm just trying to go around the way to hook up with something. Nothing changes because I'm trying to leave now and I'm trying to go somewhere close. So it's like the, the fucking thing is like, well, you clearly don't need a flight or a hotel. Services so that they become data oriented services. And this is where the question is, if you rely on an agent or you rely on a beefed up version of search, whether that's chat GPT or Gemini or whatever. Why would you care where all of this stuff was done? You're not going to care. And this is, I think, the big mistake in this thinking is that that real estate is actually much more fragile than I think we all think it is. And I think a much better way to think about this is in the future, none of this UI real estate is actually worth anything. The question is, do you have a data asset that's valuable or do you do a service that's valuable? Because agentically, there'll be all of these unemotional bots and workflows doing this work for you. So I think Sachs is right in the sense that whether it's there or not, it won't matter. Could could he run it like a private equity business where now Uber Corporation owns two services? Sure. But you're probably just better off for these agents to go and cannibalize all of search because you'll be able to just get a data feed for what Expedia has to create Expedia for a few million dollars or tens of millions of dollars. You don't need to pay 20 or $30 billion yeah. dollars for this. Yeah. I, I, the thing that I've talked to Dara about is when they said, he told me when they do something that's adjacent to what they're already doing, it explodes in terms of engagement. So like they're doing like teens and rental cars and then package delivery. And every time they do one of those adjacencies, it just takes off with the membership. And to your point, Freeberg, they have those 150 customers who have their credit cards in there. And man, it just, it's explosive. So that's what I, I think, think they're doing. Well, that's, uh, God damn. Adjacency I, to ordering food. I think hotels would be. I don't think flights would be. Because I think the flights work really well with the existing apps. But things where you... What, you flight. stupid motherfucker? The flights are like the thing that, like, what the fuck? You're like, you set the date for next week and you're like... uh Tulsa, Oklahoma, and it's like, well, you're in Fremont, California. You clearly don't want a car. It's next week. Let's see. What and then you just go to the fucking other part of the app where they book a fucking airplane, and then it says, do you need a hotel, too? Like, what the fuck? This is so easy to do. Like, I don't want to give these people any fucking ideas, but this is hella easy. Proprietary inventory. They can do it without buying Expedia. They could do it and fucking just they could buy some smaller company that does this kind of stuff. There are a lot of small, small companies that do this or hotels i think those would be very powerful and those have 20 30 percent commissions which are in line with the commissions that uber's already getting and the commissions on things like flights is very small like a couple of dollars so i think for hotels and vrbo would be brilliant for the other stuff i'm not so sure to your point chama well just to finish my my thought yeah, yeah. Please. please don't that you'll notice that uber eats a separate app from uber Right. I mean, I know you can get to the Eats part within Uber, but they created a separate app for a reason. Is because whether you're using Uber Eats or Uber, the goal is immediate gratification. I want to get to where I'm going. I don't book it. No, you. Can, I can book a car. For, I can book an Uber like months in advance. I call it right now, and the most important thing to me is wait time. This is why Uber is beating Lyft. Is but the sex, wait time? You do, hold on, the wait time yeah, is lower. Yeah. Same thing with food. I'm not thinking about booking my dinner right now. I'm not going to do it mm -hmm. in advance. If you browse, no, you can, you can, you can book food delivery in advance too. If you're like, I know I'm having a bunch of people over and I know that fucking the, the delivery apps are going to be slammed because it's the Super Bowl. I'm going to book this two weeks in advance and I'm going to get hella wings. You, you can do that, dude. It totally lets you do that. You, in addition to the rating is the number of minutes it takes for it to get to you. So those apps are all about immediate gratification. And that's why you don't want other things getting in the way of them. Now, but it I doesn't get in the way. God, I just explained that. how you could fucking do that. It'd just be like, this is hella far away from you and you want to go in two weeks. We clearly need to send you to this other part of the app where you book a flight. And then in there, it can like bug you about a hotel. The booking of a vacation 
or a hotel that you have to think about days or weeks in advance. It's just a completely different state of mind. I just don't think that there's much opportunity to cross sell that. Or, yeah, you know or, or to use the technical the jargon, I don't think the attach rate is going to yeah. be high. What about the brand value, Sack? So, because you know those people are going to another app to book their flight in their hotel. What if that other app was called Uber Travel? There might be some value in that. I can see that. Yeah. If I think uh, that would be actually the Expedia like, app, <clears throat> it would be Expedia by Uber. The Expedia app has <clears throat> such a good reputation. You hear a lot of people complaining about a lot of. You ever hear anybody bitching about Expedia? Expedia brand. Yeah. So know. maybe maybe what you could do is take VRBO, rebrand it as Uber Hotel or Uber Travel, whatever you want to call exactly. it, Uber Stay. And then maybe you could push people to download that app. Well, yeah. the thing I you know I would. The counter I give to this. You could quantify yeah. the, the value of the installs, right? So Yeah, exactly. I mean, well, you could quantify because Expedia is spending on it every year right now. I use anyway. the Bomboy app to book hotels. I use United to book my flights. And I use Uber to do my rides and obviously for Eats. When you are using it, there's a tab up top. And the UI is quite nice in Uber where it's rides and Eats right next to each other. I could see a third one like hotels or travel being right there and you wouldn't even need travel you use the regular you're telling you stupid motherfuckers you use the regular uber app because the regular uber app lets you set a date and a destination and if the date if the destination is i don't know far it just takes you somewhere else and it's like we don't offer rides in a car from san francisco to seattle so would you like to book a flight when would you like to book a flight do you need a hotel like get the fuck out of you stupid motherfuckers now it makes sense, actually. All that inventory right in there. And it could be I like, would you like to take Amtrak? I think it already suggests Amtrak. We will book my hotel and I'll book my ride for the next day in advance on Uber. And I do those things. And then when I get to my hotel, I'm ordering food to my room. So I think this actually could work really well as a third mm -hmm. tab in the app for travel. Mm -hmm. And you could actually, because when you use Eats in the Uber app, it's its own tab and it's the exact same experience. I, I believe in super apps um, and they just launched a bus that's like a bus service in New York for 18 bucks to go to JFK. That's really awesome. I think we're a little bit disconnected because we don't. They didn't them. launch the bus. We're done here. We're done. Fuck it. That's, that's the end of this podcast. I know why we didn't do the all in podcast. It makes me mad. HK would have been real mad too. Um, <clears throat> they never, they never think about like how someone would actually do this, right? They're like, they don't know any normal people. <clears throat> if you know that if you go into the Uber app and you tell it, I need to go to Denver, that it's going to bring you to a portal where you can book a flight. If the experience is good and other people are using it that way, you're going to use it that way too. You don't need another tab. You don't need shit. You just need to tell it that you're going too far for somebody to come pick you up in their fucking Prius. Nobody's going to drive you to Denver on Uber. Why are these people so fucking mind expandingly stupid? I don't understand. How did they get so rich? Uh, again, I hope Uber doesn't buy Expedia. I, I like the idea that Expedia is like an old legacy web company and that it's still independent, not owned by one of the big companies. They're a profitable business. They do a good service. They're a, they're they're great. Um, it's a good. It's a good experience for most people most of the time. So I hope this doesn't happen. But the 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 way that it would work is clear. These people just don't. They're just not very smart. They're just not very smart. They've got more money than brains, or as Kara Swisher might say, "You're so poor, all you have is money." So that's the all in podcast. Um. Ooh, boy, howdy. I don't think we're ever watching that again on the Intellectual Dollar Tree main show. If we ever watch it during red light, we should maybe watch that sometime when I'm drunk. Should we maybe check the uh, the All In podcast out maybe sometime at like fucking two in the morning when I'm still streaming on the Intellectual Dollar Tree and just barely fucking talk? I think it'd be a lot more fun. They should invite me on. I got some ideas. Although I don't want to give them any ideas. Anyway, that's been the podcast. Thanks, everybody, for hanging out. This has been the Intellectual Dollar Tree. If you're listening on the podcast, make sure that you follow us on Twitch or even YouTube. It's Echoplex Media, both places. And uh, you can support us at patreon.com slash echoplex or eplex.store. <clears throat> I prefer eplex.store because fourth wall is better than Patreon. Plus, if you subscribe at the $5 level, 
$10 level, $20 level there, whatever. You get automatic discounts on uh, many of our product or all of our products, including this tinfoil hat that I'm wearing, which comes out November 1st. Um, this is going to be a Boomers by Periscope, and um, I'll be back and we'll watch something, I don't know, equally horrifying? Who knows?